Hi, everybody. I, I'm not sure if anybody can hear me. I don't have the green box. Claire? Hi, this is Heather Staines. The green box is not coming to me. <laughs> okay, welcome today to our researcher reality session. I'm really excited um, to be able to bring you four amazing uh, researchers from around the globe today. Um, the way that we're going to organize this session is a riff on what uh, used to be called PowerPoint karaoke. And for those of us, those of you who know me, you know that I love karaoke. So this was the session type for me. What's going to happen is we're going to go through a couple slides that indicate um, some topics that we've previously identified as key in the lives of these researchers or not key depending on, on what the topic goes. And then they'll do some quick responses. We do uh, welcome your questions. I uh, have my amazing off-screen moderator um, who will be watching for the questions in the chat and questions on, on Twitter. So if you have something that's very uh, timely with one of the slides, um, you know, do go ahead and ask that question. Otherwise, we should have some time at the end to, to keep going. So if we can move um, to our slide deck now. Can we have the slides? Great. Uh, and we can go ahead and um, do a quick round of introductions. Uh, so let's start with uh, Mariana. Um, so I, I introduce myself. Um, yeah. uh, so, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow in, in Lisbon at the Institute of Molecular Medicine, and I work on parasites. Um, I have worked on parasites for many years now and microscopy. And in addition to that, I do, uh, I'm involved in pre-lights, which is part of the company of biologists where we cover preprints. We highlight preprints for the community in, in the hope that uh, it uh, promotes feedback from the scientific community that it reaches as much, as many people as possible. Great. I think we're going to be hearing more about that. Um, Jonah? Hi there, my name's uh, Jonathan Foster. Jonah, um, I'm a lecturer in the chemistry department at the University of Sheffield. Um, I've been a lecturer now for about two years. My group uh, work on um, nanomaterials. Fantastic. Osman? Um, hi, my name is Osman Aldadiri. I'm from the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Khartoum in Sudan, East Africa. Um, I'm a researcher in the areas of anesthesiology. Um, I'm, I'm working in areas of increasing research, uh, uh, reproducibility, research outcome, and uh, the visibility of African research. Uh, we introduce new models of publications, uh, and we incorporate the open publishing uh, systems in the African continent. Also, we have a special highlight for preprints in the medical uh, area. Thank you. And Beatrice. Sorry. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm a political scientist. I'm a research fellow uh, at the Center for Latin America and Latino Studies at the American University. Uh, I studied legislative politics in Latin America, and I'm a native of Brazil. Fantastic. So we're going to go right into our first slide. The impact of COVID, the obvious elephant in many of the rooms. Um, and I'm hearing that maybe not all the panelists can see the slides. So I will just say this slide is about the impact of COVID um, on your lives. So um, maybe we can uh, go in the same order that we did uh, for the introductions. So we'll start with Mariana. Um, so impact of COVID, I think the main the main issue has been uh, less access to, to the lab to do the work that we were doing all the time on one hand. On the other, it was very interesting. So our institute um, redirected the efforts of most scientists or gave the opportunity of scientists to be involved in helping uh, with various different aspects. So for example, they set up a diagnostics team where we were receiving a lot of samples from the different hospitals um, and yeah, there was another developing um, ELISAs for detection of antibodies and so on. So there were uh, multiple, I, I was very happy to be, to be a part of it. Um, other than that, 
Um, yeah, just the amount of preprints that have been coming out um, related to COVID. So I, I had the opportunity to notice them as well in pre-lights. Great, um, great. Um, and then uh, Jonah? Um, so uh, I'm uh, currently working from home uh, with two children under five um, and my wife and I are both trying to work, which is uh, always great fun. Um, I'm also busy rewriting uh, my uh, lecture courses to make them suitable for online material. And my research group are working one week in the lab, one week out of the lab. Um, so we're at about 50% capacity um, research wise, or at least it is for my students. They're um, still chucking stuff at me because they're writing up a lot more stuff. Um, so um, life's busy. <laughs> Sounds like it. Osman. Um, first of all, it started with funding. Um, we have a very limited budget for funding in our institution. So we started to see that that funding was allocated only for uh, researchers that are uh, handling the topic of COVID. So in, uh, in our case, we had uh, multiple topics that they had nothing to do with COVID. So we started to receive less funding. And the second thing, since we do medical research, uh, we usually uh, deal with patients um, so there is an in-person contact with patients and that was uh, minimized due to COVID. Uh, so we were not as able to uh, collect as many samples or do as many case studies as we did in the past. And the third impact was in publication. So in the past, we used to target um, uh, more high impact journals, et cetera. And now everyone started to notice that there is a, there is a need for preprints, especially in medicine. So that's the impact of COVID for us. We're going to dig into some of those uh, topics a little bit more in depth in a moment. Uh, Beatrice. Uh, I think to me, the, the most immediate was just uh, not being able to teach in person. Um, it's been a year since I've entered a classroom uh, and I really missed it. Uh, and since I, I had the opportunity to not teach online through the university, uh, I have been working for the qualitative data depository remotely. Um, so I've been, I basically stopped teaching and, and switched to a, a different type of work. However, I am uh, off developing and offering courses on my own uh, for folks in Brazil, and those are going to be online. So that was a good thing about COVID, I guess. Uh, it forced me to, to think about teaching online and, and to not just teach to, to my university students. Great, we're gonna go on to our next slide. And this one is preprints. I can't even remember the order I put these slides in. So these are like a, a surprise to me as well. So because this is a preprints and I can, I know that Mariana is probably, you know, jumping out of her chair virtually. Um, maybe we'll start with you. Um, so, I mean, my, my engagement with, with preprint started very much by Twitter. So I, I remember I saw one of the um, um, yeah, highlights that somebody did for pre-lights and I found it very useful. So basically it was a highlight of somebody's preprint saying what the key points were uh, and, and so on. So instead of having to read the whole, you know, uh, preprint at that point, I was able to read the highlight and I thought this is a fantastic idea because there are so many preprints coming out every day that I, I mean, if I don't have the time, I would still like to access this information sort of more quickly. And so after I saw this, I thought this is, this is a great idea. This is a great uh, service for the community and I would like to be a part of it. And so I became a member of Prelights, and now I do highlights of the topics that I that I have expertise on. Basically, trying to do the same to to make it accessible to the whole scientific community. Mm -hmm. Great. I know Osman, you um, also work with some preprints. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I work with a uh, preprint. Uh, I work with uh, Africa Archive. Uh, it's a preprint uh, initiative for African research and uh, also all work related to African, the African content. Um, we started uh, back in, I, I started working with Africa Archive back in 2019. And at the time, um, we were convincing people that, you know, there, there is an actual need for preprints and this is how they can use preprints. And um, for preprints, we see that for some disciplines, for example, like in, in uh, like physics or in biology, we can see that there is some advancement. But for medicine, there has been a quite a debate whether uh, this is quite reliable. Is it um, 
Is it a good source of information, especially that medical um, contents and medical research do actually impact the life of, of, of people, not just something? Um, and then there, there has been a debate, especially there is a pushback in Africa. But later in 20, 2020, COVID came in and everyone became interested in, in, in preprints. And then we started to highlight more preprints. We started to have more submissions. Uh, and now we are doing quite well. Great. Now, Beatrice, when we did the prep um, for this session, you mentioned that maybe the word preprint uh, wasn't that familiar to the political science uh, scene. Yeah. Uh, so after we talked, I went to do some research and it seems like APSA has a preprint uh, website. Um, it's just not something that I ever heard in grad school. Um, so we're not socialized into that. Um, so the concept is new to me. After this conference, I'll definitely uh, start paying attention to it. Um, but it's not really something that we're, we, we pay attention to as the graduate students or later on. Uh, we, we write the articles, we circulate them among our own communities, like working groups uh, within the university, and then we send out for publication. Um, that's the practice I'm used to, at least. Yeah, so that's quite different. And, and, and Joan, I think the chemists are kind of somewhere in the middle on the spectrum, right? Yeah, or at least I am. Um, so, um, yeah, I've published one paper out in, as a preprint before publication so far. Um, it was a good experience. I'd, I'd definitely do it again. Um, but yeah, I think chemistry as a discipline is certainly quite far behind biology and apparently medicine as well. So, um, yeah. Seems more, more to come. Uh, let's go to our next slide. And don't forget, if you've got questions for our speakers, um, go ahead and, uh, and share them. Uh, now the fantastic topic of uh, social media. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go to, to uh, Beatrice first on this one. Yeah, so when I talked to Heather about this, uh, this is very interesting for me because uh, I basically keep up with my field uh, through Twitter. Um, I, I, I follow and I kind of stalk uh, some scholars. <laughs> To, to be able to be up to date in the, the discussions that I'm interested in. And so especially Twitter has been very helpful uh, for me to get to know scholars, pay attention to what they're talking about. Uh, I even initiated a collaboration through Twitter um, by just paying attention to what people are posting. Um, so I use it very professionally mostly and, and it has served me very well more than LinkedIn or any other type of social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, Osman? Um, there has been a uh, quiet cultural diversity. I mean, um, uh, in here, we're not using Twitter that much. I mean, there, there are a few difficulties for us to access Twitter. So uh, almost everyone is using Facebook. Only a few handful, only a few people are using Twitter. So we rely more on Facebook and then we follow pages and then um, other fellow researchers, they just share links to like, I've, uh, I've uh, published this at uh, that preprint repository and so on. So we get and see it. So we're more on Facebook. Okay, uh, Jonah? Um, yeah, uh, Twitter, academic Twitter is definitely the, the main way of um, keeping up with papers, um, uh, keeping up with the community sort of online. Um, I did sign up for lots of other sort of forms, um, LinkedIn, um, ResearchGate, those sorts of things, but I haven't really used them probably in about a year or so, it really has become Twitter. Mm -hmm. And Mariana? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned before, for my involvement in Prelight started via a tweet. Um, in general, I think Twitter is, is a fantastic platform where I see all the advances, not just of my field, but of many others. Um, the downside I sometimes feel is that there's so much coming all the time. I don't know if I just follow too many people, but. Uh, and many journals, but um, but yeah, definitely. Sometimes I know more or less the time when BioArchives releases the, the the preprints every day, and then you see this huge amount of of work coming out, which is fantastic in terms of the work being done all the time. Uh, and then, as as Jonah was saying, um, yeah, ResearchGate is also uh, a platform where where I see some of the things. But I think for me, the main one is Twitter. Great, can we move on to the next slide? So along the similar vein of the, the social media slide, um, this one is keeping up 
with research. Um, and we did have a question that came in, um, which is how do you balance being an effective researcher with developing a good career, which I think is, is tied into keeping up with the research. Um, since you've been a little bit uh, displaced um, this year, uh, Beatrice, maybe you can maybe you can kick us off. Uh, sure. Uh, it is, well, especially during COVID, it has been very tricky, uh, not being able to go to conferences, uh, not being able to see people and, yeah, interact. Uh, so I think post-COVID, uh, within the last year at least, I have been trying to attend as many online events as I can. And one thing that I used to do before COVID um, <clears throat> that really helped me, um, and Heather even asked me how I, I got that idea, but I go to like centers. Uh, so for example, I, the one time I did this very successfully was I started stalking the event. I, I talk a lot because I was trained as a journalist. So I, I'm used to just looking for things that are interesting to me. But I, I started looking for the events that the Center for Democratic Politics at Princeton uh, was having. And I found that there was a paper being presented that seemed to look very similar to my dissertation, but just in the context of the US. So I went there, I asked to join the research workshop. I met this scholar. Today he is one of my committee members and I am adapting his work to the context of Brazil. So I think, uh, even after COVID, I am still able to like look at what scholars are presenting. And now actually it's even easier because I can just join a, a Zoom call and, and participate in research workshops. So that, that has been one way for me that I'm, I've, I've been able to keep up with research, especially recent research that hasn't been published. So another going back to the preprint conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and Mariana, you mentioned that um, as a result of your work on, on prelates, you, you've actually got to uh, interact with and meet um, new researchers across the field. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the, I mean, it's, it's a, I, at first I thought of it as, you know, I'll do a service to the community, but it has been equally beneficial for me because on one hand I get to read on, you know, a lot of the things coming out. I wish there was time for more, but, um, but as I said, you know, the preprints that come out every day is just a huge volume. Uh, and in prelights, we are able to ask questions to the researchers. So this is fantastic. And I've been very lucky that many of them, the majority reply and engage in discussion and, and, and so on. So this is, this is truly great in that sense. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, I still find it. I remember as a PhD student, I thought, oh, one, should, one could keep up with various different tools, various different pathogens in my field. Um, and I find more and more that as the different specialties, you know, get more in depth, you need more time to keep up with all the information. So, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so Osman, I know you've been spending a lot of your time um, really on, on, on the front lines, you know, of COVID. Do you have any time to keep up with research? And, and, and you touched before on not having easy access to Twitter. Can you explain a little bit to our audience um, the reasons behind that? So I'll start with the, with the reasons for having difficulties accessing Twitter. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I'm now in Sudan and there has been some political sanctions on Sudan and that included um, uh, social media platforms. So when you sign, uh, sign up for Twitter, you have to put an uh, phone number. So you get a verification text message and you cannot put any phone number that is in Sudan. So unless you have an international phone number, you are not going to be able to access Twitter. And that made some difficulty for people in Sudan to access Twitter. Um, so for, for myself, I do have a Twitter account, but I cannot follow as many uh, Sudanese uh, researchers in Twitter as, as many of them do not have Twitter accounts. So that's why we're moving to Facebook. Um, uh, in regards to keeping up with research, um, like the beginning of COVID, uh, we had a few publications, so we were always looking for new preprints, etc. But later on, we started to have like tons and tons of papers, and we were not, uh, and we did not have enough time to actually go through all of these papers because everyone was doing research on COVID. Everyone was trying to come up with a vaccine, and the research just, you know, it was it was a large number of research. And at the same time, nobody knew anything about the virus. So we had so many variations. The virus could affect people in different ways. And we were not having uh, 
uh, enough time to actually go through everything. So we were relying on, you know, like major symposiums, uh, guidelines that come from uh, ministries of health, etc. So we did not have that much time. But uh, those who are actually only researchers in the field were actually um, uh, very fortunate to keep up with everything through preprints. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, Jonna? Yeah, so keeping up with the literature seems to be a pretty much impossible um, task. Um, uh, Twitter is helpful in that you see things, but you see a fairly random selection of stuff that kind of comes up. Twitter bots are helpful in finding things. Um, in my group, uh, each week uh, we do a uh, one member gives a presentation and there's maybe five or six papers that come up on the very specific class of nanomaterials that my group are, are making and they give kind of a one or two slide summary of, of that work. So for me, that's the most helpful way of, of keeping up with the most relevant literature. But there is a vast sway of tens of thousands of papers in the broader area that you just can't even begin to touch unless you kind of specifically look for something and then tools to do that are helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and just to, to follow up, we got a question uh, coming in from Tasha. Um, when you're on Twitter, do you follow societies, professional societies? Uh, do you follow specific journals? Or is it really more the researcher side? Um, Jana? Just gonna go um, so I think I do. So um, some editors I follow, although you then they you, they either are you follow them because uh, of the person, as it were, and um, uh, they're sort of um, not necessarily just spending the whole time pushing the journal. Um, I think I do follow various journals, but they don't seem to come up. It's the retweets from people, and um, I think that's that's probably the way to get get visibility. Mm -hmm. Beatrice, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, I follow uh, specific journals and compare to politics and legislative politics uh, and democratic politics too. Uh, I do follow journal editors uh, because they keep us updated about, for, for instance, how the review process is going during COVID. Um, so that's that's helpful information to, to have. So yeah, definitely uh, it is a very good tool for that too. Okay, Mariana, I know you. You're are following a whole slew of different types of entities. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. So I, I, um, I follow, yeah, the editors, editors in chief, journals, all of it. I think you get different uh, perspectives, even on the same piece of work from the different uh, sides. So whenever there's something coming up, I try to see what the different people talk, uh, talk about. Mm -hmm. Osman, how, how does that work on, on Facebook? I'm not really sure how the following works there. Um, so uh, for myself, I do have also a Twitter account because I have an international phone number. Um, but for social media, what, what we really actually helped me is that uh, we also that, um, you know, publication that said only 1% of the global research output come from Africa. And then we go all around and we see African researchers involved in so many African, uh, in so many uh, international research. So the, the percentage never goes up. And we, we have been in so many gatherings in the African continent, like African conferences, as we, we talked a lot about this. And many people were actually saying that there is no, you know, inner African collaborations. So there is a, a conference happening in Africa, but I don't know about, there is an initiative happening in Africa, so we do not know about. Um, so for me, following um, as many uh, African organizations, um, also journals and societies that really helped me, you know, make some inner African collaborations within the continent itself. Mm -hmm. And then that, there are and so many African societies and organizations are actually using Facebook as well. So it is, it is, I don't know if it's an African thing, but that, <laughs> but this is how I see it. So we use Facebook. We also use Twitter. Some of us are also using Twitter. So following them helped me uh, foster some sort of collaborations with African continents as well. And I also follow some of the international journals uh, and some societies, international societies as well. Great, it sounds busy. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Funding, some of you have um, touched upon funding before and I know in particular, depending upon where you are studying and in some cases where you're from, that can be a challenge. Beatrice, you mentioned uh, funding was a challenge from your side. 
Yeah, absolutely. Not being a U.S. citizen living in the U.S., uh, I have access to very, very little funding opportunities. Um, what I've been able to do is I applied to several very, very, very small grants. And uh, with that, I've been able to do research. But um, so just one example, the main congressional uh, funding, it's all available to U.S citizens uh, who study the US Congress. Um, and my own country in Brazil is uh, right now experiencing some difficulties in terms of value of education and research. So there is no funding available there too. So yeah, definitely a trick, a part of doing research for uh, a non-American citizen in the US and a Brazilian citizen um, whose government is not really valuing research. Yeah, Aswan, you mentioned um, particulars around funding when we did our uh, preparatory call. Um, yeah, uh, we have, we originally had very limited funding. And then after COVID, that funding was mainly directed to, towards COVID related research. So we started having very, you know, very little funding these days. Mm -hmm. uh, Jana, how, what's the impact from your side been? Um, I think chemistry is so far been sufficiently far away that it's not that the whole field has diverted all its money towards um, COVID, um, although I guess the broader longer term impact we, we just haven't haven't seen. Um, funding and getting funding is my job. That's basically what will get me promoted and what will keep my research and, and group around. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely central uh, as a metric for how I measured. Yeah, Mariana. Yeah. Um, so in in my case, I've I mean at the moment I'm in in Portugal and I have a human science human frontier science fellowship, but I have worked in several countries and the the differences in in funding affect everything. So from doing research, uh, the time the type of material that you can get, how fast can you get it. Uh, this is a huge limitation in some settings. And the other is access to information, right? So some universities have um, the, the, the library, for example, pays for this, for this access to several journals, but in others it's not. And so without access to open science, it's very difficult mm -hmm. also to publish. So the publication costs in some journals are huge. And mm -hmm. without that funding to, to pay for that, then yeah, the, the different journals where you can't publish is, is very different depending on the setting. Yeah, let's go on and do the next slide because I suspect maybe it's related to, yes, publications. So perfect segue there. Um, and we have, um, you know, a number of publishers, um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in attending today. And there's been some questions that have come up around um, uh, t whether or not you use tools on publisher platform, so what, if anything, you would suggest to publishers who might want to help with that research overload. Um, but I also want to hear the degree to which you're interested in open publishing. So um, let's go and start with Osman. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have very limited funding. And due to that limited funding, we do not have any funding to cover APCs. So, um, all researchers in Sudan, either they pay their APCs from their own pockets or they go for, um, you know, pay, pay publishing journals. Some publishers actually uh, offer waivers, waiver programs. So we do target these, uh, those journals and others don't. So we, we have this major problem. And then we started, um, you know, lobbying and advocating for more uh, funding for research and for that. We also specify that there has to be some budget for APC coverage. And, and also some of the publishers, they just go way beyond the numbers. Like you have to pay a thousand dollar or even more to publish your journal, to publish your article in, a, in an open journal. And for some people, they cannot afford that. So they might be forced to go to more paid journals. Great. Uh, uh, Jana, you said that there's been a lot of um, publications uh, happening now um, from, from your team. Um, you know, what, what are the key things that spring to mind around publications from your side? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess in chemistry, we publish a reasonable amount. So I've got, I 
I don't know, five, six papers in, in preparation that we're trying to get out sort of in the next uh, next couple of months. Um, uh, some of those are done by PhD students who have to be funded by uh, EPSRC from the um, UK Research Councils, and they can get their open access fees paid for. Others are funded in other ways. They've got no support. So some of my papers will go out open access. Some of them won't. And it, it's just whether there's money to pay for it or, or not. Um, sometimes you can get funding uh, centrally from the university, but that seems to also depend on the time of year um, uh, as to whether we've run out of that money or not. Um, yeah, so I, I think open access is a good thing, but there's a new set of barriers uh, that seem to be created and, and new sets of unfairnesses as well. Mm -hmm. um, Beatrice, when you're looking at uh, targeting places for publications, what are the key things that you keep in mind? Uh, so we don't uh, usually consider open journals that much. And uh, when I was talking to Heather, I was uh, mentioning that we are about to send, uh, well, hopefully very soon, <laughs> a paper uh, about teaching qualitative methods. Uh, and we are prioritize, we prioritize the impact factor of the journal, right? Uh, that how prestigious the journal is and, and how that helps us advance, uh, especially in my case, my young scholar career. Um, so that that is the key. And it has been the key for my dissertation too. Uh, the journals I'm thinking about sending parts of it is uh, they're all, uh, I'm, I'm basing it on the impact factor too. Um, so that for me as a political scientist, that, that has been the, the, the standard. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to follow up, um, you know, again, on if you had any ideas about anything that publishers could do to um, help with information overload, to help with those challenges. Do you use any publisher created tools? And I, and I recognize that I didn't let Mariana answer yet on the open question. I'm, I'm saving that. So, Mariana, do you, what do you other than uh, I, I know you're a huge open enthusiast, but are there tools that you're either using or that you think make that easier for you? Um, in terms of the overload, uh, not necessarily. I think I have more access to more of the work com coming out, which I think is great. Uh, and I and I, I don't know. I think the fact that it's available is is truly important for me. So I think in our preparatory call, I mentioned New Bias, which is this organization in Europe, which um, it's about image, uh, image analysis and repositories of imaging, which in my field, I think it's super important because for a long time, it has been that people select the, the one or two images that are representative and, and then all this bulk of information is lost. You never get to see it as a, as a reader. So so yeah, in terms of tools, there's also GitHub. There, I think there are various uh, different things. In terms of organizations, I was also part of ASA Bio Fellows, which mm -hmm. I think also aims to bring, um, to make science more open. I think that's, but in terms of overload, it, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Any, anyone else use any tools that they've found particularly helpful? Okay, um, there's a lot of questions coming in on um, work-life uh, balance. Um, and I realize we're not gonna get through all our slides, but I didn't wanna do that. I didn't wanna rush this because the conversation's been so great. So there have been questions about, um, you know, how you're juggling during this time, particularly if you have teaching or administrative duties, how can you do everything you need to do to prepare for your career? and still manage to do a presentation like this today. We can bring our slides down too, so. Uh, Jono, can I start with you? Um, yeah, you just have to choose which ball to drop each day, I think is the way I've uh, concluded to look at it. Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I think, uh, I guess, I don't think there are good answers. I think at the moment um, it is just compromising and, and certainly I've not been able to write grants. I've not been able to um, start new things. I'm just trying to hang on and um, keep things going um, and keep my, the other thing is like uh, researchers need a lot more support at the moment. These are very difficult conditions to work in. So there's a lot more just supporting the group and, and helping them um, is, is another big uh, load. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mariana? 
Um, so for, for me, in terms of balance, I mean, during the, during the pandemic, it was a challenge to define boundaries between, you know, my, I think many people will, will identify between my free time and my working time uh, and also between the different things I do. So, for example, at some point I realized I was doing too many, too much of my own work and then had paid less attention to the, to the pre-lights that I like to cover. And so I had to put, eventually I managed, I, I, I did schedules. So from this hour to this hour, I do certain things. From that hour to that hour, I do other things. And I try to keep as much as possible with this, with this schedule. But I, I, for example, I don't have teaching to do. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beatrice? Uh, yeah, so I think to me, uh, the most important thing is to treat everything as a job. And I'm, I've been very uh, adamant about that, which means that uh, I take my time to do my Pilates, I take my time to ride my bike, and I take my time to play with my dog and to read my fiction books, no matter what. And I relate very much to what Jonah said. Uh, it's a choice between which ball you're dropping every day and balls are being dropped every day. <laughs> and if, if I'm able to, if I'm, I want to get at least through some of it, I need to have my, my downtime and I, I prioritize that very much. That's good. I think we can all take from that lesson. Osman, how about you? Um, for us, it's be more like uh, work versus research. <laughs> so work and research balance. So you have to work and at the same time you have to do research because you have to um, see patients and treat patients. But at the same time, you have to do research, conduct research. So we're trying to couple both of them at the same time. So um, um, we deal with patients. We also, you know, uh, join them into research and then we collect samples and everything. And at the same time, every once in a while, you try to take some time off. Great. We've got about two minutes left. And I just love just a quick answer from each of you about what th you think might in post COVID, assuming we get there, what, a, what, what's something that may have changed about research? Uh, Jonah. I think conferences is um, probably one and, and communication. Um, you know, this has become very normal in a way that it, it hasn't been, uh, it doesn't really matter whether the person you're working with is in the next room or in, uh, the other side of the world um, and I think um, that's got some advantages hopefully it'll mean you can travel a bit less but and go to more conferences and attend more things but I think we're also very keen to get back to seeing real people. Great and Beatrice you may be keen to get back to your stocking but what do you think is going to happen? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think teaching is uh, definitely not going to be the same um, and I'm excited actually to see how we can better. Uh, I've, I've been learning a lot about how to do online teaching and I'm excited to try to do some sort of a hybrid, even if we're doing in presence teaching uh, when, whenever we're able to do that. Yeah, we got about one minute. So I wanna give Mariana and Osman a quick chance, Mariana. Uh, I think for me, the main thing that the, that the pandemic taught us was uh, removing these barriers uh, and borders, as, as Jonah was saying, between, um, between people. So now you can talk and it's normal to talk to someone in Australia and to in Latin America and so on at any time. We, we saw that it's possible. And the other is the boundaries of, of part of our scientific community that I don't think we always consider like people with disabilities that find it difficult to travel to conferences. I think now it's more inclusive, which is great. Great. Um, Osman, really quickly. Uh, sharing medical research openly will be taken more seriously. Now it's known as a life-saving thing. Great. Well, I want to thank um, all of our speakers uh, for, for joining us today. I know I've learned a lot and I think we could even do another uh, session uh, maybe next year. Um, please take this opportunity to update your participant survey. Um, next up is a 30 minute break from the main program. So per usual, if you wanna just take a break and get some coffee, feel free to do that, but there's plenty to do at Researcher to Reader. Uh, you can stay in the virtual networking rooms to chat with people if that's what you're missing most is connection with people. Um, if you wanna continue the conversation with some of us from this panel, um, or with Ivan Aronsky about research integrity. Uh, some of us may be in the Great Hall for a little while. If you wanna meet new people, there's the Serendipity Lounge. If you just wanna chill, the Quiet Garden. Uh, to do any of this, you just need to click in the upper left to go back to the timeline uh, and then click on the networking agenda item. 
And the link in the session information box will take you right to the networking learn rooms. You can also go to the exhibits and check out some of our sponsors. And right now there's the first of the lightning poster sessions, which is Tracy Teal on data publishing. Again, you access this by going to the timeline, clicking on the lightning poster agenda item, and then using the link in the session information box to go to the Zoom meetings. Enjoy a busy break.